Good evening, everybody. Monday Morning Quarterback, episode 36. Hope you're having a fantastic start to your week. We are busy here getting our USAC teams ready for the Western Swing as they're going to be heading out um, to Arizona tomorrow to finish off that. Uh, we're fortunate to have a couple players in that championship race with Kevin Thomas sitting atop the standings and Tyler Courtney in second. So hopefully one of our guys can uh, grab that championship for us. That would be awesome. Uh, we're sad to not be making that trip. We're just busy here developing uh, our new products, trying to get our new shock trailer um, ready to be built out. That's going to be done at Intech later this week. Um, so any of you guys that are out there and need shock assistance, Jake Swanson is a dealer and a rebuilder for us, more than capable of getting you, you fixed up. So um, tonight we are going to take a trip down to Speedway, Indiana to go to the Bell Pro Shop. So I know it's not the typical shock suspension torsion bars that we're used to. Um, that is going to remain the core focus of our program moving forward. However, we're, we're so blessed here in Indianapolis to have all these great resources. Bell's literally less than 15 minutes from our shop. So we wanted to show you um, a couple other important parts about your race program, safety being one. So we have a couple of these special segments we'll feed throughout the winter. One of the ones I'm most excited about is I'm putting together a segment um, kind of about the business of motorsports, mainly how you add value um, to your sponsors. And that's one of the reasons we went to Bell, is they are like-minded like us, doing a lot to promote their athletes. And so we got some good footage there as well as they're going to share um, how their athletes are adding value to them and how they're supporting their athletes. It's always a two-way street when it comes to sponsorship. So we're looking forward to bringing that to you at a later date. Um, definitely leading into PRI, we'll release that. Probably a two-part segment. Got a lot of um, people in the industry at the high levels of marketing, um, the decision makers of these bigger companies, and we're talking to all of them and recording that. And we'll compile all that and uh, give you guys some, some good nuggets to take into PRI. So, uh, as always, we will answer all of your tech questions once the video is done. Um, if there are questions about helmets, I'll do my best to answer them. Otherwise, I will refer you to Chris at Bell. Um, but if they're race car questions, that's what I'm best at, and I will answer those. So anything that popped up over the weekend or throughout the course of the season and you just haven't had a chance to ask, we will definitely be able to assist you with that. So without further ado, we're going to go to this video um, with myself and Chris Wheeler at the Bell Pro Shop in Speedway, Indiana. Hope you enjoy. How's it going, Garrett with CSI? Here with Chris Wheeler from Bell, and uh, he's going to explain a little bit about the importance of having a proper fit on your helmet, making sure you've selected the right helmet for your application, and some things you should check out during the off season to make sure that your helmet's going to be good and keep you safe next season. So one of the keys going into the off season is going to be looking at all of your equipment to make sure that it's still within the time limits of the homologation. Make sure there's no you know cuts in your interior. Make sure there's no padding falling out. Make sure also it doesn't stink. Um, one of the big parts about what we do in the off season also is have everybody check the outside of the show. It could have fallen off a bench in your trailer. It could have been fallen off a park stand. Kids can throw it. it, it kids are kids. Um, heck, adults do it. So um, those are the key things to look for. Um, another thing, especially with youth drivers, is that they're growing constantly. Heck, I know adults, again, that their heads are still growing. So, um, checking that, you don't want to compromise your safety by one of the helmets that's too small. A um, couple right retires, a safer kid. You know, where's the value on it? So, one of the important things is to make sure that, look at it now. Is it a bit snug? Is it a bit too tight? Let's look ahead for the next size up. Let's get it get it ordered, because everybody else is doing the same thing right now. For sure. That way, for the holiday season, you can have the thing in time to go winter time. Having a helmet under the tree for Christmas. Um, you know, <laughs> sizing is another big part of it. You know, parents like to take stagger tapes or random things and measure their kids' head with it. We have these proper head measuring tapes. All you have to do is call us. We'll send you one. It's no charge, absolutely free. We'll show you how to use it. Or stop it here at our pro shop, and we'll, we'll be sure to size you up. But sizing for it, especially a youth helmet, is a very important thing. Um, helmets aren't one of those things that you can hand down generation to generation, or big brother to little brother, whatever it may be. Like. Maybe a suit or a pair of shoes. The helmet is designed to take it down. 
once that impact has been absorbed, you need to send it back to us um, so we can, or whoever you manufacturers for that matter, so we can check it out. We're just, we're just doing a picture of the same. Um, you know, we had a driver this year who, of all things, set a helmet on top of this car, he pulled out of the parking lot and it dropped on the ground. Well, that impact of going 15 miles an hour when we turned the corner and it fell off on, a, on Highway 44 and hit, he would have normally said, oh, I'll pull over, grab it, throw my bag, and keep going. He said he brought it here, it actually cracked in the backside of the shell. That thing was no, was no good. If he would have taken a hit there in the race car with damage, serious injuries. Cool. Well, we thank you for that insight. Uh, if anybody has any questions and you're in the greater Indianapolis area, fill out the Sweet News uh, Speed Shop down here in downtown Speedway, or you can see them at PRI in December, um, or just give them a call and they can hook you up. Thanks, guys. All right. Hope you guys found that informative. Um, thank you to Chris Wheeler there at Bell for taking the time to kind of show us around and show us some of the things they are doing. Um, so one of the unique things about Bell is there, there's multiple divisions to the company. So there's the whole um, bicycle, helmet, um, at, you know, kind of sports side. And then there's the racing division, which is totally separate, separate ownership, everything. So they're totally race-driven, building high-end racing uh, safety equipment, kind of like we are solely focused on racing and building high-end racing shocks. So like I said, we're really like-minded. Both both of us are trying to promote our athletes and uh, give back as much as possible. And, uh, and so it worked out really well for us to go down there and, uh, and have that conversation with Chris. So we hope all of you guys enjoyed that. And um, if you have any questions, like I say, fire away. I'll be more than happy to answer. And uh, also um, racing-related questions as far as making your race car go faster. Because like I say, that's my level of expertise. The guys at Bell um, are the safety experts, but I could probably answer a few questions. I've banged my head in a Bell helmet a couple times, um, and they've always kept me safe. So uh, while we're waiting for a few questions, we've had several people ask about the trade-in program and looking for further details and information with that. Um, pretty simple. Email myself, Garrett, at CSIShocks.com, a photo of what you're wanting to trade in, along with the new package that you're after. Okay, I will reply back with um, trade-in value, number one, number two, a quote for the new package, and then three, what you're looking at cash out of pocket. We've had a number of people take advantage of this. Um, it's a great way for us to get some people on our product that previously couldn't afford it, um, and also people that want to upgrade. Um, to, to new stuff. So we've been able to take those older model CSI shocks that were traded in, freshen those up, and get some people on our product that uh, maybe couldn't afford a new set. So we're totally behind the trade-in program. We're going to run it through November and, uh, and then we'll kind of assess from there whether we continue on with it um, uh, in the race season. I just think it might be a little hard to manage in the race season. That's kind of why we were doing it more in the off season. So. Don't delay if that's something you're interested in. Um, we're definitely going to run it through November. Um, all right, let me look over here and see if we got any questions coming in. I uh, got a few of you guys tuned in here. Steve can't hear us very well. I don't know if you were referring to the video or the live segment here, Steve. Um, if so, we'll have to work on the audio of our future videos. I did a trial run and we were able to hear it okay here, so not not quite sure what uh, what part you couldn't hear, but we appreciate the feedback. So uh, anybody that's tuned in have questions related to what we saw and learned down at Bell um, or any questions with your race car, we would be more than happy to answer that for you. Uh, Todd. If you take a PSI out of a gas shock, does it help lock down the shock? Um, so as you, there's a minimum amount of gas pressure you'll need to run in that shock based on the build, the base valve, etc. I apologize the air compressor noise in the background. I am at the shop. Um, but 
as you decrease gas pressure, it'll slow down the reaction of the shock, so effectively making it feel like it has softer compression, more rebound, which would be more of a tie-down shock. As you increase gas pressure, the shock will then react quicker, feeling like more compression, less rebound. So I hope that answers your question. Typically, smooth slick track conditions, we reduce gas pressure, um, especially in the rear shocks for added grip. John Randall, when do I know if I need more compression or more bar? Um, so that's a very good question. They do two separate things, okay? Um, the, the torsion bar rate is there all the time where the shock um, is, a, is a changing rate based on the shock curve and everything. So torsion bar is pretty linear where a shock we can manipulate it um, based on the piston. So if overall you're just traveling an excessive amount, I would say you need to go up on spring or bar. If you feel like you have a bounce or a hop in one area of the track, then we might be able to make a shock adjustment to fix that. One caution I always make to people is, let's not tune for 5% of the track and slow ourselves down on the other 95%. Sometimes, especially dirt track racing, we just gotta compromise on that one rough area of the track. But generally, if you're just getting excessive travel or you feel like um, you're just overall too soft, that would be a spring or a bar change before it would be a shock change. But good question there. Uh, not a problem, Todd. So um, while we got you guys tuned in and we're looking for more questions, a couple things to keep your eye out from us this week is uh, we're going to launch our new website later this week. Hopefully we got our fingers crossed. Um, and we got some cool new apparel, uh, new hats, beanies, long sleeve and short sleeve t-shirts, and we'll have a new zip up before um, we get into Christmas shopping and head to the shootout and all that. So look out for the new CSI website. A lot of you guys that submitted photos are featured on that website, and we certainly appreciate that. Uh, Nick Freeman, what's the best way to store a shock, compressed or extended? Um, it doesn't really matter. Typically, we would store the shock um, kind of mounted on a shock rack or hung from a nail in your shop or a post in your shop. And uh, it's okay to let them um, be stored fully extended. Typically, we do it uh, shaft up. And, um, but it doesn't, shouldn't matter one way or the other. Um, sometimes a twin tube shock, if they lay flat on a shelf, the gas bag can relax a little bit um, and then we might have a slight air pocket that would form in the shock if it sat flat for a long period of time. Um, pretty rare, but we have seen that in the past. So gas shocks, it doesn't really matter, but I usually always mount them um, hung vertically. Um, John Randall, who commented earlier, as we were going to get to our race results, his son Chase picked up a win at the Red Dirt Raceway in non-wing, and uh, teammate Evan Spalding got his first career uh, restricted micro win. So we love seeing these quarter midget kids move to the micros and get their first win. So that was really cool. Um, Jake Swanson, who I mentioned, mentioned earlier um, as a shock rebuilder of ours, he picked up a big USAC Western midget win at Ventura, kind of the last tune-up before turkey night in Mitch Johnson 68, riding on uh, CSI shocks that he tuned himself, so that was cool. And then uh, Tucson uh, QMA got kicked off. They kind of run a winter series out there to not race in the, the dead of summer. And the Erickson brothers both got wins as well as the Thurin brothers. So that was cool to see those guys get started off um, in a good way. Uh, Todd, it doesn't matter if you store the shocks with gas or not. Unless you're running a shock that has an extreme amount of gas pressure, like maybe a modified shock where you're running two to 300 pounds, at that point I would get down to 25 or 50 pounds in it um, to store it. But most of our midget sprint car guys, micro guys, we're running in that 20 to 50 range. It's okay to store them like that. You won't, you won't have any damage um, to, to the shocks. Anybody else that's tuned in have questions for us. Um, 
about your race program. We know a lot of you guys are winding down. Um, we're going to work on a couple uh, more maintenance videos, how to rebuild your shock rod end, and uh, some other things like that um, to give you guys some, some stuff you can work on over the winter to get your stuff uh, kind of freshened up. If you're not due to send your shocks in, some things you can do to um, just keep them in top shape to start the season. Um, Nicholas Freeman, moving from a, a micro to a 305, he's asking, is there big tuning differences? Um, the same principles are going to apply for the most part. Um, that's why micros are such a good um, stepping zone to move to sprint cars, especially if you're running a like a Jacob's Ladder style micro sprint Z-Link that's got the same um, rear suspension as a sprint car. All the same principles are going to apply. Um, shock tuning is going to be very similar. Um, so yeah, all of, all of those things are going to apply and it should be a pretty smooth transition for you. Your biggest challenge would just be in the driver's seat um, going to a heavier race car. Um, but the, the same principles will apply and if you have any questions with that 305, let us know. That's a, a market we do a, a lot of research and development in and uh, we attend, attend a lot of 305 races. So. Aaron, uh, again, asking about storing shocks for the winter. <laughs> you can tell we're towards the off season. Um, you can store them in a shock that isn't climate controlled if you're not in Indiana. If you are in Indiana and your shop's going to get close to freezing um, or your shocks are in a trailer that's going to sit outside and get freezing or below, I would recommend moving them somewhere where you're going to be in that 40, 50 degree temperature. Reason being, the seals tend to get hard um, when they're in that, that real cold environment, and you can see some weeping. So we don't like to see them sit um, for long periods of time below freezing. Um, for a night or two is not a big deal, but if it's going to sit two, three, four months throughout the winter in freezing temperatures, that's not something the seals really like. Uh, Steven, digital or traditional shock gauge and why? Um, so I have the luxury to use either. I typically use a traditional shock gauge. Um, in my experience, the digital gauges are so sensitive. My OCD goes crazy. I'm trying to set it 45 and it's going to 43 or 46. And it really doesn't matter. Um, you know, a pound or two, nobody's going to notice that. Uh, unless you got Kimi Raikkonen driving your sprint car, I don't think anybody's going to notice a pound or two uh, shock pressure wash. So the traditional gauge has just been easy for me to kind of get it to the number and, and go with it. Um, I've yet to see a digital gauge that lets the pressure out slow enough that you can kind of accurately get what you need. And maybe it's just that I'm used to using a traditional gauge. I've used them for 10, 15 years now, um, but that's my personal preference. Keith, um, you're asking a question about adding rebound to the left rear shock or tying it down. What type of race car are you referring to, please? Um, <clears throat> Todd, so it kind of depends. You're asking the difference between a small body and a large body shock on a uh, wing 360, and is it the difference just cooling? It's actually not with our shocks, and I can't speak for everybody, but with our shocks, it's a totally different design. Um, typically, the large body, um, you got a larger diameter piston, you can flow more fluid through it, um, and you can control things a lot differently. So for wing racing, we highly recommend our large body twin tube, um, simply because we've got some pistons that we've designed for that shock, we're flowing enough fluid through that larger um, diameter piston, and, uh, and we're able to get a much better dampening curve more grip, um, more control, and so we definitely prefer the large body. Um, they do cool better, uh, as you mentioned. Um, we're getting, uh, there's more fluid in there, so it doesn't get hot as quick, and, uh, and, the, and they just, they cool a little bit better, but we do it more for a design standpoint is why we prefer it. Uh, Keith, a 270. So Keith's question on a 270 micro, let me find it. If you're, get, uh, if you're tight getting in, is it correct to tie the left rear shock down? So if you're referring to tight as your nose and over on the right front, um, or you're just sticking the right rear tire too hard, 
Adding left for a rebound will keep the car freer on entry. It'll hold more positive um, tilt in the car, and it'll help you roll the corner a little bit better if you're snug on entry. So yes, that is a correct statement, Keith. Samson, you're outstanding. Appreciate it. Um, Shane, we will be at the Tulsa shootout. Um, we're going to have our new shock trailer for that, so we're excited. We should be parked in our same spot over by Factor 1, same place we've been the last five or six years. And, uh, yeah, so we're, we're pumped up to go to Tulsa. Awesome event for us last year where we swept the micro division, winning all six drillers. So don't know if we'll be that fortunate again this year, but we're going to go and, and help all of our customers and hopefully win, win a few more drillers. That'd be awesome. Um, Nick Freeman. Um, I think you're a Wing 305 guy. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, your question is, how do you know when to use a bump rubber, when not to use a bump rubber? And if you're referring to wing racing, I think you should run a bump rubber at all times. The key is how big your gap is, okay? The gap is very, very important, and then from there we'll determine what um, bump rubber stack we want if you're using our progressive kit or if we're just going to run a traditional foam conical in a, in a bump uh, cup. So that's a pretty complicated question. Might be best if you um, shoot me an email or give us a call, but I'll give my best, to, my best to explain it. So if you don't have a bump rubber at all, you go down to the end of the straightaway, and let me see if you commented, yes, wing 305. So you don't have a bump rubber, you go down to the end of the straightaway, the car wings down and it lays so far left that it actually gets the right side tire out of the track. So if I hold this pin up, the car wings left, what's it do? It pulls this right rear out. You can tend to slide the right rear, get free. Um, now if we have a bump rubber, we travel down and we get into that bump rubber and it starts to load this tire, we don't get as much positive tilt in the car and we have more overall rear grip. Okay. Um, now, if you have too tall of a bump rubber and it doesn't let it travel enough to roll the corner the way we need, then that's an issue as well. But usually we can tune that. Um, so a couple things the bump rubber is going to do. It's going to eliminate it winging so, down so far that it gets the right rear out of the track or that um, we drag the rail, uh, which upsets the car. Even if you have a raised rail car, if you don't have a bump rubber, sometimes you can drag that rail hard enough that uh, it upsets the car. And then two, as we start to squeeze that rubber, it loads the tire. So it's going to give you more drive from the center off. Um, so on a wing car, we want more even rear drive. We're not leaning to the right rear like we would on a non-wing car. So that bump rubber is going to help us do that. Okay. Good question. If, uh, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube page, uh, Nick, do that because I have a special segment. Um, I did a Monday morning quarterback that just goes over bump rubbers. It might be two-part, um, but I've started to upload all those videos to YouTube so they're easy to sort um, if you don't want to dig through our Facebook. They're on our Facebook page as well, but we have a special channel on our YouTube page. Just search CSI Shocks, and you can watch a video that's nothing but bump rubber technology, um, and I think that would help you a bunch. Randall, yeah, picked up another win uh, over the weekend with his son Chase running the bump rubber on the right rear of a micro. So smooth and slick. Uh, it's hard to beat that new progressive kit we have. It really helps stick the right rear tire, um, and, and we've made some big gains there. Now we got to get back to work and figure out how to make it work a little bit better when it's smooth and rough, um, which is a, is a challenge. But smooth and slick, it's going to be hard to beat that progressive kit we have. Hopefully we can get those type of track conditions at the shootout. Anybody else that's tuned in have questions? Um, we ask that you like these videos and share these videos. Um, that helps fuel the fire, helps uh, us spread the word and um, get a little more recognition for the time we're putting in to bring you guys all this content and uh, we certainly do appreciate that. So, If nobody else has any questions, um, we're going to sign off. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we'll have another cool program for you next week. And uh, we hope you all have a fantastic week. Good luck wherever you're racing. If I didn't get your question answered, shoot me a message and I will do it or I'll comment here on this feed. Take care, guys. Have a good night.